All right, welcome to today's call. And today I wanna to discuss a topic that is very common in clinical practice and gets a lot of rep on the blog sites out in the blogosphere and on Google. And that topic is SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And SIBO has been a known diagnosis for decades, but it's been kind of a hit or miss in terms of developing well, uh, well made and reliable diagnostic strategies in terms of testing. And the classic symptoms are gas and bloating associated with constipation and diarrhea, typically after eating. And so um, initially, say 10 years ago and before, SIBO was looked at as a diagnosis in and of itself as a disease condition that was its own entity. More recently, research is finding that SIBO appears to be basically a, more of a syndrome or a set of symptoms that's associated with a, an underlying cause or a disease process separate from SIBO. So SIBO would be a symptom of something else. And I wanna dive into current research today that is explaining that. Many patients present to the office with gas and bloating and diarrhea and constipation, and they will be told they have IBS, IBS-C if you have constipation, IBS-D if you have diarrhea, or IBS-M if you have mixed. And sometimes IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is occurring in and of itself without SIBO, but research also shows that up to 36% or so of IBS cases may also involve SIBO. And it's tough, again, to determine whether or not IBS and SIBO are two different things in some people. So we want to dive into this because it's, SIBO is very common in clinical practice. And basically what it, what it means, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you might be saying, well, what's the big deal? We have our gut microbiome. Shouldn't bacteria be there? Well, yes and no. Yes, we have a gut microbiome, but in science, gut means colon. So when, we're, when you're reading the scientific literature and they say gut, or you're reading my book and I say gut, that's referring to the colon. If they're talking about the intestine, they'll say the intestinal area, right? Or So if I'm saying gut microbiome, we're talking about the, the probiotics, the bacteria, the microbes that should be in your gut or your colon. If I say uh, if I'm saying the intestinal uh, environment, then I'm talking about the intestines. And the intestinal environment should be relatively sterile of microbes compared to the colon. So if the colon microbes enter into the small intestine, now that can develop into SIBO because in the small intestine is where you're finishing your digestion of your carbs, proteins, fats of the foods you take in, your fibers, et cetera. So if the colon contents, the colon microbes, your microbiome, um, friends and foes, if they, trans, if they transmit up into the small intestine, now they're living in an area that is full of substrate for them to eat, right? So your microbes love to eat um, fiber you may have seen supplements with prebiotics and probiotics in them. Well, prebiotics are fibers and starches that probiotics love to eat. So if, if the microbes from your colon move up into your small intestine, they're there with all the fiber you've consumed with different sugars like glucose and fructose and galactose, proteins, fats, and so they may metabolize those things, ferment those things and produce gas and they can produce different gases they could produce methane which typically drives constipation type symptoms and they could produce diarrhea or excuse me hydrogen which promotes diarrhea type symptoms and so we don't want to have these microbes in the wrong spot the microbiome is good when it's where it should be which is in the colon colon predominantly if large amounts reflux up into the small intestine, now we may develop SIBO and experience symptoms of gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, the feeling of a rock or brick in your stomach. Uh, many times I've had a woman say, 
after I eat, I bloat so bad. It's like I'm six months pregnant. Symptoms like that. So if SIBO is not its own entity, if there's a deeper underlying cause, then what could those deeper underlying causes be? If we look at this 2019 study from Current Gastroenterology Reports, the, they list, the author lists potential underlying causes. And so I will go over them with you today. One is altered anatomy. So anything that promotes stasis or basically a slowing down of, of peristalsis and things moving through the intestines in the colon can promote SIBO. Because if, if, if you don't have that down flowing peristalsis or that downward wave through the GI tract, the purpose of that wave is to move contents through, right? So move the food through that you've eaten, but then also keep microbes in the colon down in the colon. If you lose that peristaltic wave, those microbes could enter backwards through the ileocecal valve that separates the small intestine from the large intestine and enter the small intestine and start fermenting your substrate. Another cause of SIBO could be what's called hypochlorhydria. And hypochlorhydria is fancy for low stomach acid production. And stomach acid is your main protein digester, but it also is, uh, functions to sterilize the duodenum or the first third of the small intestine. So if you're not producing enough stomach acid, you may not be sterilizing the small intestine of microbes well, which promotes SIBO. And then also, if you're not digesting your protein efficiently and it moves into the small intestine maldigested and you have microbes in there, those microbes could eat the protein, ferment it, and now produce gases that lead to gas floating, diarrhea, or constipation. Dysmotility and hypomotility. Basically, tags tags along with the first point, which is altered anatomy. So if you have dysmotility or hypomotility, the difference there is hypo means low motility, dysmotility means dysfunctional. Maybe you have too much or too little, and maybe it varies. So too little could lead to constipation, too much could lead to diarrhea. Um, what could cause hypomotility? Well, if you have an autoimmune disease like scleroderma, hypomotility is common there. If you have antibodies to your migrating motor complex, which is um, a, a part of the GI tract that drives that peristaltic wave, if you have antibodies against that, then again, you're going to have dysmotility or hypomotility. If you have Iliocecal valve issues. The ileocecal valve is the valve between the small intestine and the large intestine. It should be a one way valve, meaning things flow from the small intestine down into the large intestine and not vice versa. Things shouldn't come backwards from, up from the bottom. So if your IC valve is hypotense or say doesn't hold the tone that it needs to to keep things down in the colon, then you could have microbes reflux up and result in SIBO. If you have immune deficiencies like hypogammaglobulinemia or HIV or um, different things like that, that can result in SIBO. And one thing they mention here is called vagal neuropathy. That's related to HIV infection. The vagus nerve is, is the parasympathetic driver or the central nervous system driver of gut function. So the vagus nerve leads from the top of your neck or basically from your brainstem and goes to the GI tract and drives secretion of stomach acid, secretion of pancreatic enzymes. It drives um, peristalsis, so that down, that down flowing peristaltic wave. And the vagus also provides an anti-inflammatory benefit in the gut. So anything that damages the vagus, whether it's an HIV associated neuropathy or you've had a traumatic brain injury like a concussion or we're in a big car wreck or you know there's there's multiple ways to damage the vagus if you lose that vagal motor outflow you lose all those you know the the secretion the absorption the peristalsis and the anti-inflammatory benefit which promotes dysbiosis in the gut SIBO and gut inflammation if you have small intestinal disease whether that's inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, um, 
or celiac disease, then those things have been found in the research to promote SIBO. One study found that up to 62% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease, both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, have SIBO present. And then chronic pancreatitis can result in SIBO. Why? Well, the pancreas produces your digestive enzymes for the small intestine. And those enzymes um, are digesting your carbs, proteins, and fats. And so if you have a pancreatic issue and a decrease in pancreatic enzyme production, then you're not digesting your foods well. Again, providing fermentative substrate for the bacteria and gas bloating, diarrhea, constipation, et cetera. Liver disease has also been associated with SIBO. And interestingly, in liver cirrhosis, so, so high amounts of liver scarring, SIBO has been linked with the occurrence of encephalopathy, both overt and subclinical. What does that mean? Encephalopathy, think brain inflammation. So here's a gut-brain axis um, mechanism for SIBO. So it, it'd actually be a liver-gut-brain axis, right? So patients with cirrhosis um, are at an increased risk of brain inflammation because of SIBO and intestinal inflammation that isn't dealt with. Also, if you have liver issues, you could have um, motility issues, you could have mucosal immune issues and leaky gut or gut barrier issues, which also promote SIBO. The gut-brain axis, which we talked about with the liver, is also involved um, in diseases such as Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis. And studies have shown that SIBO is involved and associated with those diseases as well. So SIBO could be associated with neurodegeneration like Parkinson's disease, or neuroinflammatory, neuroautoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. I can say clinically, I've experienced in my practice that that is the case. And in, in people that I work with that have Parkinson's disease and gut dysbiosis, whether it's SIBO or some other form, if we deal with the gut, they do better globally. In multiple sclerosis, people I've worked with, same thing. If we deal with the gut, they do better globally. So even though this study says, um, as yet, the impact of SIBO eradication on motor and non-motor symptoms has not been defined, it hasn't been defined in this giant study in the literature, but clinically, there's doctors all over the world that I'm sure would echo what I'm saying, and that's if we address the system, and we're addressing a system that has GI dysbiosis, SIBO, et cetera, by addressing that successfully, not only are we improving GI symptoms, but neuro neurological symptoms involved in gut brain axis disorders as well, and global symptoms depending on what the person is presenting with. So it's really cool that we can address the GI and improve someone's brain. And then, like I talked about at the opening, irritable bowel syndrome, it's, it's debatable in the research whether um, SIBO is common in IBS, whether SIBO and IBS are the same thing etc. So um, we won't spend a lot of time on that, but what I will say is I have a SIBO channel on my YouTube channel or a SIBO playlist, and so I do, I have made a video about SIBO and IBS connection, SIBO causes and treatment targets, um, all kinds of videos related to SIBO if you want to go learn more and watch. Also, in my book, I talk about SIBO, dysbiosis, and multiple other GI disorders, um, and how we need to address the person and the whole person in order to reap benefits from um, treating, quote unquote, SIBO or gut dysbiosis, et cetera. You'll see in the research here that under management in the paper we're looking at, it says, when one searches for high-quality evidence on which to base therapeutic decisions in SIBO, one soon finds that the literature is scant and, in general, of low quality. So basically, all the literature is going to show, say is that antibiotics help sometimes, but not every time, and they might only help short-term. Well, if, we, if you've been on these calls for very long, when you work with me, you realize that instead of looking at a SIBO case as gut only and just 
microbes out of whack. If we look at the person, right, as a whole puzzle, and SIBO is just a piece of that puzzle, and we address all the dysfunctional pieces, then we get better results with SIBO itself and the complaints from, of that person's case as a whole. But we don't want to just say, well, rifaximin doesn't work anymore. Antibiotics are only effective sometimes. Let's say, well, how do we address the whole picture? Because the point of this whole study was to say, is SIBO a real diagnosis or is it an effect of other underlying chronic issues? It appears to be an effect of underlying chronic issues. And the second study here supports that. So this study is, is the most current on nutritional implications, diagnosis, and management. And basically it says there is no true gold standard for diagnosis of SIBO and it is important to identify and treat the underlying disorder causing SIBO. So if someone says they have SIBO or you've been told by a doctor that you have SIBO, the likelihood is there's another step lower or deeper in that they need to go to find, well, what's causing SIBO? So that you can get to that, address that cause, and knock out that thing, whatever that is, and by doing that, also addressing the SIBO. So that's what I look to do as a functional medicine practitioner. That's what my book talks about, is helping you understand that thinking. That's what my YouTube channel uh, talks about in terms of the playlist on SIBO. And that's what the research is pointing to as well. So don't just fall into the trap of, you know, I, I need to take probiotics and my SIBO will be better, or I need to take an antibiotic and my SIBO will be better. It may, but it may not. In the complicated cases, the likelihood is it will not be better just from taking a probiotic or just from taking a course of antibiotics. You need to get to the deeper root.